Welcome back, everyone. This lecture is going to be all about our friends, the Cnidarians. So this word Cnidaria, which yes, starts with a silent C, Cnidaria means stinging thread. And unsurprisingly, the organisms in Cnidaria can often sting, right? And they include things like jellyfish, anemones, and corals. And among these, we have about 9,000 different species of cnidarians. Right, so let's take a closer look at these cnidarians. Now, like we said, that word cnidaria, it means stinging thread. All right, so each cnidarian has tentacles. All right, so if we look here, We've got multiple tentacles on this cnidarian, just like there's tentacles on a jellyfish. Each tentacle is covered in cnidocytes. Now, if you were with us for the beginning of biology, way back at the beginning of the semester, you'll remember that cyte or cyto means cell. So these cnidocytes are stinging cells, or more accurately, cells which have organelles in them that are capable of stinging. Okay, Because each cnidocyte contains an nematocyst. And this nematocyst is the organelle inside the cell that is capable of stinging. Or it is the stinging structure. So these nematocysts right here are single use, kind of like a bee's sting. Um, they can't be recycled or put back in. And the venom inside of them, um, how toxic they are, as well as the barbs or the hooks on them, differ by species. So you may have gone to an aquarium and touched a sea anemone. It kind of felt like it was just sticking to your finger. Whereas if you were stung by something like a Portuguese man of war, that one has much stronger venom and sharper barbs. It's going to hurt a whole lot more. All right, so let's look at how these nematocysts work. So steps to a nematocyst firing. The first step is that something triggers the nematocyst. This might be some kind of behavioral or chemical cue um, from the whole organism is, or from the organism as a whole. Usually it's that this trigger right here on the outside of the nematocyst is bumped. Um, since this is the trigger, this also means that since it's not always just under like the neural control of the cnidarian, if you just like touch a dead cnidarian or touch a cnidarian or a jellyfish that's washed up on the beach or touch a tentacle that's been severed, it can still sting you because it is really just a reaction from that trigger being touched. So something triggers the nematocyst. The nematocyst is actually, when it's inside the cell, is inside out. An osmotic pressure causes the nematocyst to shoot inside out really fast, like within milliseconds. Okay, As it shoots inside out, the venom and the barbs or hooks go into the victim. So what do cnidarians use these nematocysts for? Well, unsurprisingly, they use them to capture prey, and they use them to defend themselves against predators. However, one thing that people aren't always aware that cnidarians can use this for is for protecting themselves against competition. All right. So cnidarians are stuck to one spot, which we also call sessile. All right. And if you are stuck to one spot, let's see, you're a cnidarian right here, and you have another anemone, for example, coming in and trying to like creep up on your space, 
you're going to reach out with your tentacles and actually sting that other anemone until it backs off and goes away. Okay, so this is one way that cnidarians can protect their spatial territory is by stinging their competitors. So now let's take a look at our cnidarian body plans. There are two basic cnidarian body plans that are actually kind of just flipped upside down. So let's look at the first one. The first one is a medusa. Yes, it's named after the snake hair lady in Greek mythology. All right, so our medusa looks something like this. All right, this is the free swimming or mobile body form. Okay, the other possible body for a cnidarian is called a polyp. And it looks like this. And I'll draw the ground here so you can see this polyp is typically sessile. All right. So examples of polyps are things like anemones and corals. Examples of medusa are things like jellyfish. Um, you can see they have the same basic body parts. We've got tentacles. We've got a mouth or an oral surface. And then here and here, we have the gastrovascular cavity, so basically where they do their digesting. They're just upside down from one another, and one can move and the other can't. So cnidarians, all cnidarians, have one or both of these body forms during their lifetime. There are some, and we'll take a look at this, that can actually alternate between medusa and polyp depending what point in their life they're at. So let's take a look at our six characteristics. For symmetry, we have radial symmetry. If we are looking at an anemone or a jellyfish from above, we can cut it anyway, as long as we're going through the central axis to get um, mirror image halves. Okay? For their skeleton, they have a hydrostatic skeleton. The gel inside them is called mesoglea and their muscles pull against that gel. For the digestive system, there's only one opening, which means it is an incomplete digestive system. Okay, for their circulatory system, they don't really have one. Water's just, or fluids and um, dissolved substances just diffuse across their tissues. They have no segmentation. And for their nervous system, they have a nerve net that reaches across their bell and sometimes down into their tentacles, um, they do not have a concentrated brain area. So now let's look at our types of cnidarians. You don't need to know the class name for this, but if you want to, they're class Cyphozoa, and these are generally our jellyfish. I'm going to just point out a few that we would see here in Georgia, um, but before we do that, just know that our jellyfish, these guys are free swimming, and they are medusa for their whole lives. Some common Georgia ones include moon jellies, cannonball jellies, which you will frequently see washed up on the beaches here, lion's mane jellyfish, which we don't really see close to the coast, but we might see farther out. And you can see if this is a scuba diver, that is a very large jellyfish, um, as well as sea nettles. So those are some possible Georgia species. Our next group is our anthozoans. This includes our anemones and corals, and our anthozoans spend their whole life as a polyp. Other than their lar larval stage, but when they are settled, they are just a polyp, um, which means they are sessile for their whole lives. We've got a few different groups of these. Um, our first one is going to be our anemones. Right, our anemones typically are soft-bodied. They just have a hydrostatic skeleton. And um, they're usually solitary. They live alone. This is in contrast to something like our soft corals, which have a flexible endoskeleton underneath 
their polyps, which have a hydrostatic skeleton. So this is things like sea fans and sea whips, the ones that kind of ripple underwater. Um, these guys are not solitary. They are actually colonial. So basically clones, so polyps that all have the same genetic information, are living right next to each other. And if you look closely at a soft coral or even a hard coral like this one, you'll be able to see all of those individual polyps living together. So then our last group is our hard corals. Underneath the soft hydrostatic skeletons of their polyps, these guys have a hard endoskeleton made of a mineral called calcium carbonate, which we sometimes abbreviate as CaCO3. Okay, this mineral is going to crop up a lot in invertebrate biology. It's what many endoskeletons are made of in the ocean. This hard endoskeleton is what allows them to build reefs. All right. And just like our soft corals, these guys are also colonial. All right, so that's our anthozoans. Our last group then is our hydrozoans, all right? And this includes things like our hydras, which you'll see in our lab, and our siphonophores. The siphonophores and the hydras, or the hydras, these guys have both medusa and polyp stages during their life. And it varies whether the um, polyp is the adult or the medusa is the adult, depending on the species that you're talking about. So, um, some of these are colonial. For example, this Portuguese man of war right here is often called a jellyfish, but it is not, in fact, a true jellyfish. If you look closely at the tentacles here, what you'll see are polyps instead of just nematocysts sticking off. And so there are polyps throughout the body of the Portuguese man of war that have different functions. Some are for capturing food, some are for reproduction. So it really is just a colony of polyps um, that come together to make up one large body. Right? And then some are solitary, like this hydra, which you'll see in your lab, um, which is a freshwater. Hydrozoan. Right, so knowing that those are our classes of cnidarians, if we come to our cladogram, we're going to put our cnidarians on this branch right here. Okay, you can see that unlike our periphera, these guys have tissues and are symmetrical, but unlike the rest of the animals who have bilateral symmetry, these ones have radial symmetry. All right, so remember, at this point, you're going to move on to your um, hydro lab. Remember for scientific drawing that you draw what you see, you use the whole space, you include lots of detail, you label structures, colors, textures, and features, use insets, include a scale if you can. And so right now, what you're going to do for our STT invertebrate biology is do part two, or the hydro observations of your sponge hydra and planaria lab. And we'll see you back here for the next lecture.